Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. While James is getting out of his dress, we will... Um, sorry to have some laughter at your expense, James. Um, I want to simply say how grateful I am for your being here because this really is a moment for us to observe and give thanks to God for and to celebrate. Um, I have served with uh, four, I, I'm very fortunate to have served with four very um, gifted organist choir masters over the course of my 30 plus years and most of those have been with James. Um, I needn't tell you that you and I are in the hands, I think, of a musical genius when we come into that room, not only in his playing, but also in how he's envisioned the entire liturgy and also the entire worship experience. What many of you may not know is that for people who work closely with James, it is a deeply spiritual and pastoral experience because although God did not call him to be a priest, God gave him all the charisms of an exquisite pastor and priest. So without further ado, I give you James Walker. Thank you so much. First, let me uh, confess that this is truly a very strange feeling. Like, <laughs> is this really happening? Have I truly been working here for 30 years? I'm sure it sounds cliche, <clears throat> but in many ways, it seems like only yesterday I auditioned for the associate organist choir master position. Ray Egan was the director of music, and when he had decided I was a candidate, we met together with director George Regas. The one issue I most remember in that brief interview was about longevity in the job. <laughs> George expressed his belief that staff members who really make a difference stay at least three years. <laughs> and I responded that I really like to establish roots where I work. And as I stand here today, and in front of George, I think it is fair to say that I honored that commitment. <laughs> I've been asked to reflect on those 30 years of music ministry and on my vocation as a musician working in the church. So let me start with one of my earliest memories from the age of about three years old when I was baptized at First Presbyterian Church in Santa Monica, the church where my parents were married raised their family, and faithfully served all of their lives. I vividly remember being held up in front of the congregation, seeing all those people and bursting forth in a blood-curdling scream. <laughs> this initiation into the church established a lifelong and deeply emotional relationship with the church. <laughs> and here I am, over 50 years later, and I love Jesus more deeply than ever, and I still love, love his often wild and wacky church. <laughs> How did I come to All Saints? The very early chapters of my journey formed me and led me to my vocation and ultimately to All Saints. Since my very dramatic baptismal day, I have attended church virtually every week of my life. As a kid, it wasn't an option. My dad was a deeply spiritual man, and my parents made church life the centerpiece of our family life. I loved Sunday school, learning the great stories of the Bible and of this man called Jesus. Music began to take a role in my life almost immediately with kindergarten choir at the church and piano lessons. A turning point came when I was 11. The woman who was to become my mentor was hired as organist choir master at First Presbyterian in 1968, and my life was changed forever. Marcia Hannah Farmer was a lifelong Episcopalian and truly a trailblazer in her profession. Women, of course, were not priests in the 1950s and 60s when Marcia was in school and beginning her career, but women were not organist choir masters either, at least not in any major church position. 
She was talented, dedicated, pastoral, spiritually grounded, and tenacious, and for many years had a well-respected career in the Episcopal Church. In 1968, due to an unlikely sequence of events, she was led to First Presbyterian Church. I remember with the greatest joy singing in those various choirs, choirs over the following years under Marcia's direction. All those rehearsals, creating beauty together, and then offering that in worship. There were so many thrilling moments of communion with God, making music. I can still imagine the physical sensation of singing a high A as a boy soprano. <laughs> a dynamic column of air rising through the body with such intensity that you think it might just push through the top of your head. As inevitably happens, my voice changed, and as many good choristers do, I began studying organ at the age of 13. <laughs> I fell in love with the organ and cherished those hours of practice every day after school. I believe that a large part of music making is about communion with those who composed music that we bring to life centuries ago or yesterday. This music making is a mysterious and intimate relationship between human spirits. I am so connected to Johann Sebastian Bach, church musician, organist, choir master, born almost 300 years before me. Especially as the years have passed, I have come to appreciate at an even deeper level the gifts Marcia gave me as a mentor in church music. Recognizing my potential, teaching, encouraging, prodding, challenging, and drawing the music out of me in such a way that I could grow to be a leader. She taught me that my talent is a gift from God, and that in cultivating my gifts and sharing them with others, God is glorified. I knew at the age of 15 that I wanted to be an organist choir master. I even wrote a paper about it for my high school guidance class assignment on career options. <laughs> and that's just weird. That's just... <laughs> That's just weird. <clears throat> and I, as I reflect on those high school years, it is important to note that that dimension of my formation, of being eccentric, of being literally out of the circle, that became so important in my spiritual formation. I was not only a painfully shy, chubby, completely unathletic nerd and loner, who went to church every afternoon to practice the organ, <laughs> but a homosexual, for God's sake. <laughs> as painful as it can often be, it, it really helps to have the experience of being the other, at least in some way, as you seek to follow the one who embraces and includes all. I have come to recognize it as a gift and it has guided and informed my ministry all these years. And under the circumstances, I am so grateful that I had music, and particularly music in worship, as a creative outlet to communicate feelings that I could not possibly utter. Psalm 42, as the deer longs for the water brooks, so longs my soul for you, O God. The week after my high school graduation, I was hired as organist at Westwood Presbyterian Church. Thus began a wonderful, deepening journey into my relationship with God and the church. I was at Westwood Press for nine years, spanning both my undergraduate and graduate years at USC, and had the good fortune to work with two very fine and very different directors of music at Westwood. I learned so much about the choral art during those years by accompanying and observing. Those years at Westwood provided an amazing training ground, not only in church music, but in theology. I began to have my mind and heart opened in exciting ways. I heard challenging things about God's love and justice and peace that I never heard at my home church. Sometimes it made me very uncomfortable, a true sign of growth. A living faith in the midst of doubt and ambiguity was embraced. That was new to me in the context of life in the church where often dogma is prized over expansive thought and experience. During this time, I certainly knew of All Saints Pasadena. In fact, All Saints served as the USC organ studio for Cherry Rhodes at the time. 
So during my four-year study with Professor Rhodes, I came here every week for my lesson, and I gave my master's recital here. And it brings us to 1982 when I completed my master's degree in organ performance. That year, I was also appointed college organist at Occidental College. The associate organist job here at All Saints became open, and I was encouraged to audition. Long story short, I got the job and began in mid-February 1983. I was 26 years old and was hired essentially as an ace organist with virtually no conducting duties to accompany Coventry Choir, the one adult choir of about 35 members at the time, and to play major organ works, anthems, and service music for the one primary Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock. It was pretty straightforward and clear on paper. It all sounded so very sweet. <laughs> I walked into my very first Coventry Choir rehearsal on the third Thursday of February, 1983. The choir had been asked to come half an hour early to have some discussion led by the rector. There sat George Regis, Ann Peterson, and the young curate, Franny Hall. The topic, a controversy in the choir over changing the text in a Rachmaninoff anthem from Blessed is the Man, to blessed is the one. It was a wonderfully strange yet amazing discussion about the power of language, open-mindedness, change, and inclusion. Sitting off to the side of the room, I thought to myself, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Here I stand, 30 years later, asking the same question. and rejoicing in it, because this clearly is a church I want to be part of, where there is such a dynamic openness to exploring faith together, where we can search for truth and find our way to God in differing ways and still come to the altar rail together. So let me give you a snapshot of the liturgical life of All Saints 30 years ago. In 1983, as I mentioned, we had one adult choir, one sung service on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., and every other Sunday was morning prayer with no Eucharist. We did use a printed liturgy each Sunday that very roughly resembles that which we use today. It was typed each week on an IBM Selectric typewriter, <laughs> pasted together with rubber cement, and run through the mimeograph machine. And I still keep that Selectric typewriter in a corner of the music office as a touchstone. We were still using the 1940 hymnal as the primary source for our congregational song. Even Christmas Eve was sweet. Only two services. <laughs> two, not three, not four. Two services. The 4 p.m. family service and the 10.30 p.m. with Coventry Choir and Orchestra. In the 1980s, some things that we would absolutely take for granted were introduced into our liturgical life on a regular basis. For instance, it was not until the early 1980s that the grand piano was permanently moved into the chancel of the church, allowing for a diversity of styles and much greater flexibility for experimentation. That was the phrase we used when we ventured into repertoire that did not originate in Europe. <laughs> Experimental liturgy. Today, I believe those who worship at All Saints expect music from many cultures to be part of our liturgies every week. However, the process started gradually, one piece at a time, and has continued in that way all these years. All Saints was a big church, and as we continued to grow, we began a Sunday morning schedule of two services with choir on All Saints Sunday, 1985. To do that effectively also demanded the birth of a new choir, as one choir with that five-hour Sunday morning commitment every week would not be sustainable. This is how our current Canterbury Choir was born. It was a y'all come sort of affair at the beginning, an outgrowth of people who sang each year in summer choir. We started out rehearsing a couple Saturdays each month and singing about one Sunday a month, and each year the time commitment of Canterbury grew incrementally. These were fantastic years of personal growth, musically and spiritually. I still kept my membership 
at Westwood Presbyterian and that, and at the time, and kept an arm's length from the Episcopal Church, though I was being nurtured and formed by the liturgy of all saints. As I mentioned earlier, my experience of being the other has been so important in my spiritual growth. And I feel fortunate that I was brave enough to attend the organizational meeting of what was to become galas, gays and lesbians of all saints. And it was during this time that I summoned the courage to come out to my family. That empowering act was also incredibly painful, especially with the fundamentalist wing of my family. And I was upheld and strengthened throughout that journey by this community. Why is that so difficult? Everyone is included. All are beloved of God, just as we are. Without question, this has been a light that has guided my ministry. Fast forward to 1991. The church sanctuary was closed the Sunday after Easter that year for a six-month renovation. We were worshiping here in the forum, four, Sunday, four services each Sunday, one spoken, two with choir, and one with quartet. Without getting into details, we had a bit of a blow up in the music office that summer, and I was summoned back from vacation to help make it work, as we used to say. It still makes my head spin to think of what transpired in those four months, keeping the music department ship afloat in pretty rough waters, while still worshiping the forum, having our first homecoming in the street extravaganza, moving back into the renovated church and the rededication of the sanctuary in a blaze of glory, followed the next week by the Mozart Requiem with orchestra. It was a rich and full time. And at the end of that, <laughs> at the end of that, in mid-November of 1991, George Regas hired me as director of music. In 1992, I made the decision to be confirmed and officially became an Episcopalian. It felt like coming home. Also in, in that first program year, I gently shepherded the transition of Canterbury Choir into adulthood with a weekly rehearsal schedule and audition process. How both Canterbury Choir and Coventry Choir have grown over these 20 plus years, not just in numbers, but in commitment, excellence, understanding of mission, and pastoral care in community is a source of the greatest joy to me. How 55 people can come into a rehearsal room week after week with all the stuff of life on their hearts, and through the rigorous preparation of music, can be united together and transformed into an instrument of healing is a miracle. The 1994 to 1995 program year was another monumental season as we celebrated the long and distinguished tenure of George Regas and welcomed the new rector, Ed Bacon. Permanently imprinted in my memory, is my one-on-one -on -one meeting with Ed, the week he was chosen as rector in January 1995. We sat together in my office and he asked, how are you doing with the transition? Well, that took me a little off guard, but I thanked Ed for asking and then proceeded to verbally vomit out all that was going on <laughs> in my life. In addition to the enormous transitions at All Saints, I was going through a divorce, and my dearest friend had been murdered just months before. It was a tough time to keep positive and hopeful. And Ed was terrific. I say in all honesty and without even a hint of kissing up. <laughs> Something that Ed can attest that I do not do. He communicated how much he was looking forward to working with me and that he wanted me to stay on. I remember talking about how at some point in my career it would be great to work in a place like Grace Cathedral with magnificent acoustics, but that, that almost always meant doing only one type of music, which isn't of interest to me. And I remember looking the newly appointed rector in the eye and saying, so where, where else would I go? I guess I'm stuck here. Ed laughed and 
commented that I might wish to rephrase that. (laughs) He offered the suggestion that you might say that you're well-rooted here. And Lord have mercy, what a wild ride it has been with Ed Bacon these 18 years. Those first few weeks, I can remember saying, at least to myself, can we just keep something the same? (laughs) I meet with the rector virtually every week to plan liturgies three to four weeks in advance. More often than not, these planning sessions lead to theological reflection that will shape and guide our community in worship. I think it is important to you, for you to know that Ed and I often disagree, and I hold that as a high value in our working relationship. Our liturgical life has been greatly enriched over these years as we've added new repertoire and gone through the often painful process of letting go of hymns and anthems that we may have cherished. And we certainly have added many liturgies over these years, even songs, jazz vespers, Tizé service, contemplative Eucharists, and of course, the 1 p.m. Spanish service. It has definitely been a rich journey. As I started a draft of this talk, writing about highlights in these 30 years, it became clear to me that those milestones are not what this time has been about. Most everything really comes back to my call to ministry, which I learned when I was a kid. Recognize your gifts and the gifts of others. Cultivate and nurture those gifts and share them with others to the glory of God. This is what has sustained me through continuous change and transitions. The details of my vocation have changed. I couldn't possibly foresee certain directions my career would take, such as studying Afro-Cuban drumming and incorporating that into worship. I never imagined myself being co-director of our inspiring youth choir for eight years. But the, voc- <clears throat> but the vocational foundation has remained constant. I do love playing and conducting concerts, and I sometimes miss the uniquely energizing work of teaching on a college campus, which I enjoyed for more than 20 years. But preparing music and offering that sung prayer in worship and with the community is the deepest thrill. The footsteps of parishioners coming to the altar rail mingled with the gentle words of the body of Christ as we sing a well-prepared, beautiful anthem becomes a tapestry of prayer that is unparalleled in my experience. The choirs of All Saints have achieved an admirable reputation in the Los Angeles arts community, and I'm proud of the fact that we've appeared with the Los Angeles Philharmonic on numerous occasions. I'm thrilled when professional organizations have invited us to perform for their national conferences. But you know what? While I deeply appreciate that recognition, the joy is found every Wednesday and Thursday night bringing two communities of singers together to work intensely on music, always striving for excellence, always raising the bar, and sharing our concerns and thanksgivings and praying together, and then coming together with the larger All Saints community week after week after week and offering the fruit of our labors to the glory of God. Sweet hour of prayer. I've worked with a lot of different staff members over these 30 years, all of whom have touched my life in some way with their unique gifts. Some were more fun to work with than others. (laughs) And though I take our work here very seriously, I have found it invaluable to keep a sense of humor and to laugh often. I'm particularly grateful for all the musicians, lay and professional, who have given so freely of their time and talents to make our worship so vibrant. And I'm grateful to the entire All Saints community for the love, nurture, and challenge I have received over these many years. Thank you all, and thanks be to God.
help me with this, but we have 10 minutes for questions. Right. Good morning, Jim White. Nancy Mackey, raise your hand. Oh, uh, Before my question, I want to remind you that I offered to come and sing in one of the choirs, and you said you had so many sopranos, but if I'd bring a man with me... I always remember it, Nancy. I remember. Where's the man? <laughs> All right. My, my question is, when you're selecting music for the service, what besides uh, coordinating it with the theology or the theme of the service, what are some other principles that you're using to select the music? Um, not in any particular order. Um, bottom line has to be excellent. I, I, I don't intend to ever uh, offer anything that is not of, of excellent quality. I don't care where it's from in, in worship. Um, excellent quality that will be um, excellently prepared and offered. Um, not, I'm not aiming for perfection at all. I, I spent so many years um, in therapy getting over that. <laughs> and I t intend to talk to my grandmother about it in heaven. <laughs> but excellence is a, is a bottom line. In every, if every liturgy, we want a balance of, of styles and um, affects, feelings. Um, I, I used to say, because it happens so often, it doesn't happen quite so often, that, that people come up really angry after liturgies. Um, and it's because I've, I've ticked them off by a particular selection, and I, I, I think that's good. <laughs> you know, Because not everything's going to speak to somebody. So we really want to have... Some people need the intellectual stimulation of a Bach fugue, and others, that doesn't move. And something that's much more simple, uh, one of the things we sing at communion is part of that. Uh, so balance in, in that sort of style, and then balance in, in um, some sort of equilibrium with uh, music from different cultures other than Europe. Um, so... Uh, I always start with the lessons. I always start with the gospel because no, ma no matter what, we're going to read that and, and um, the collect for the day. So I spend some time with, with the what is going to happen, what's going to be said. And then I bring that um, together in a, a worksheet. And then Ed and I talk, and he says, well, I'm not really going to talk so much about that. Can we focus on something else? And so, is that helpful? Thank you for Hi, being here, James. Hello. A uh, couple of quick things. First of all, uh, your gift of humor allowed music to be in this room this morning to hear everybody laugh. So I want to thank you for that. That was just terrific. And just you're, you're just the best. And whatever arguments you alluded to between you and the rector, we don't know any of that because every Sunday morning it's seamless. So thank you, too, for your working relationship. <laughs> I have more of a nuts and bolts question. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you feel that to do what you do really well, you have to be both a choir director, choral director, and a keyboardist or organist. And I also want to know which you consider yourself primarily to be. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think um, everyone needs to do that, but for me, it's been the, the two are intertwined. I mean, as I said, I just you know my mentor was an organist choir master, and the two just went together. There are a lot of great, fine, fine choral directors who couldn't possibly sit in an organ and do anything, and vice versa. So, so it's very it's it's important for me. I'm a better organist because I'm a choir director. I'm a better choir director because I'm an organist. What was the second part? Oh. Um, it depends on what day of the week. <laughs> James, I want to also thank you so much for the wonderful music through the years. I've been fascinated by the locations that you choose for your sabbaticals, and I would like to hear you talk about some of those experiences. Wow. Well, that's a big, big question. It might be time for another one. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think it's almost, it's coming on seven years. Um, <laughs> wink, wink, wink. Um, oh, I thought you meant another question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's such a big question. I was in a different place in 1998, and we were, that was my first sabbatical, and we were talking about, Ed sent me to this awful place in Chicago, um, uh, one of those mega church places, and and so I, I was the first part of that. I was going to to really really big churches and see how they were growing and all that, um, and visited um, Taze and and um, did a larger trip with uh, Barbara and Marty Coleman to South Africa, which was more about uh, my transformation and going to some place that was so different. Um, and then my second sabbatical was. Um, was was very different and was more about uh, per, get, gaining more skills and education, um, and then because of certain things that were happening with my mother and 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 family issues, it, it meant being a caretaker um, also during that time, and it also meant getting married. <laughs> so um, so I don't know, that, I, that's I would take a long time talking about my sabbaticals. So that's a little snapshot. This is not a question. It's something I want all of you to know if you're not in one of the choirs. And that is the amount of personal preparation that this man does before he meets this church. And the honor he pays us as volunteer choir members to start on time, end on time. He has every minute planned. He knows exactly how much time to spend on each piece, each phrase, and having sung in a lot of choirs in my life, this is not always true. And it is a tremendous honor to us that this man pays us every week. Thank you, James. Before, before Justin says anything, thank you so much, Susan. I, I, I hold that as a high value to honor people who volunteer so much of their time. And then I want to say the second part that I've really learned over the years, because I do have um, every minute of that rehearsal planned, is that that's the framework, and the framework is going to get changed. And so um, those who are privy to my rehearsal order will know that I don't stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> But we do always end on time, and and the music is the program that that is brought about by the music making, um, informs that that time. Okay, Justin, I'm ready. Uh, James, <clears throat> excuse me, James. After being with the choir about 20 years or 21, um, I just want to thank you for being the great person you are, very generous and warm-hearted person. But most importantly, because I come from a family of educators, my parents were educators, my grandfather was an educator, thank you for being a great educator. I mean, for me, as someone who hadn't sung in a big church choir before, and being an engineer and not a musician, uh, I've learned so much. And I know that's probably true for many others in the choirs, so thank you for helping me and others as an educator. Thank you. You're welcome. The other thing um, a lot of you might not know if you don't sing in one of the two choirs is the incredible role of pastor that James plays for all of us. Um, I have had um, bouts of very, very serious illnesses, and James has at times had to say to me, I'm going to step into my role as pastor here and tell you you should not be singing this Sunday. <laughs> and I've said, you're right, I shouldn't. Okay, I'm going to go home and go to bed. Um, he is just such a loving and caring person, always approachable, always we always feel that he's nurturing us. Um, this is my, I think, ninth year in choir. And I started the second year 
saying that no matter how difficult the music was that James threw at us, and no matter how we looked at it sometimes thinking, oh my God, I can't possibly sing that, my phrase ended up, almost my mantra being, James loves us into the performance and the mastery of the music. And I have never had a choir master that does that. That's part of his pastoring. His pastoring is so innate, both in himself and the way he approaches us, that it also enables all hundred plus of us to feel free to nurture and pastor each other. And that's one of the highest tributes I can think to give you, James. Thank you so much. Closing words. Ladies and gentlemen, our friend James Walker. Thank you. <laughs>